much for taking the time to download and listen to this week's show. If you like what we do, please give the show a like and a share. And if you love what we do, you know, please consider becoming a patron. It really helps us to develop and bring more content for yourselves and also for the movement in general. Um, this week's show is an absolute cracker. Um, it was with Kohai Seito, a Japanese philosopher and an associate professor at the University of Tokyo. Um, Kohai works on ecology and political economy from a Marxist perspective, and his books include Karl Marx Eco Socialism, Capital in the Anthropocene, Marx in the Anthropocene Towards the Idea of Degrowth Communism, and his latest book, Slow Down the Degrowth Manifesto. Uh, for many people that have been following the show, we've been covering degrowth for a long time now. And I believe that Kohai is a really crucial addition um, to to the episodes that we've done before. And his idea around degrowth communism has really sort of uh, made waves, um, not without criticism. There's a little bit of infighting at the moment, um, especially online, which isn't great to see, but completely understand it. I mean, theories need to be, to be thrashed out. They need to be challenged. Uh, my personal hope is that we can somehow get some sort of agreements and, and cohesion about about actually putting this these theories into work. Um, some of the topics on the show are Kohai's background as a Marxist scholar, um, which is immense, uh, Marxism in Japan, his theory around a more environmental Karl Marx, which he found in Marx's later writings, um, criticism of his work, we discussed that, the environment movement as a whole, and what actions we should be taking, um, all of us. I found his uh, conversation, I found him really warm, uh, very genuine. Um, he, did as, he did as a solid, really, because in Japan, it was like really late at night, because obviously the time difference, and he was a great guest. I never felt like he was trying to get off from the show at all. A real gentleman, uh, really enjoyed the conversation, and I hope you do too. So, on with the show. Kohei, a warm welcome to the show, mate. Hi, thank you for the invitation. Oh, thank you so much for coming on. For people that don't know, it's it's about ten o'clock in uh, Japan, so we uh, really appreciate <laughs> yeah. your time, pal. Um, okay, so okay, it's great to have you on. A little bit about yourself, please. Uh, so I'm a Marxist scholar in Japan, teaching at the University of Tokyo. So basically, my approach is about reinterpreting Karl Marx philosophy. Uh, in the age of the Anthropocene, because uh, he was often criticized for advocating a kind of the absolute domination of nature. So he is basically an ecological thinker. I argue, in contrast, that he was clearly an ecological thinker, and he also provides a clear, more sustainable vision of post-capitalism, which we actually really direly need. So this is a very great source of inspiration that yeah, I'm really looking forward to discussing this issue with you tonight. Brilliant. And as okay. you said there, you are you are a bona fide scholar of Karl Marx. Now, at some point, I'm, I'm guessing that you were probably more class conscious than climate conscious. So was there, was there a moment or is it more of an evolution of your thinking that made you decide that actually, you know, the environment and, and the climate crisis is so big and so all encompassing that you really need to sort of start thinking about it and bringing it into your into your analysis? Oh, yeah, I entered the college in 2005, and that was like the time in Japan when uh, more and more precarious jobs and the te temporary precarious workers were increasing. And I was struck by the fact that the many people are working so hard, but they are suffering from the constant threat of losing jobs and the precarity and the puberty and so on. And that uh, was actually confirmed in the middle of the economic crisis of 2008. So that was a moment when I really decided to pursue my career as a Marxist scholar. And uh, then, yeah, as you said, it was more like a traditional issue of class inequality and exploitation of workers and so on. But in order to pursue uh, my career, I went to Germany. I, I went to Berlin to study Marx there. But then right after moving to Berlin, it, there was a huge earthquake uh, in Japan 2011. And then that yeah. was followed by a very disastrous uh, nuclear explosion mm -hmm. in Fukushima. So I was actually uh, very, very shocked, obviously. 
But by the fact that I didn't really pay attention to the issue of relationship between human and nature, the ecological questions, and you know, I was wondering how Marx would have responded to this kind of issue because I was also, in a sense, traditional a Marxist because I was also endorsing a kind of vision of. Uh, emancipatory potential of technological development and so yeah. on. Well, how do we explain this nuclear energy? Uh, it was supposed to, you know, uh, kind of count, it, it was supposed to count as a kind of development productive force, but it's actually really destroying the environment and people's lives and so on. So I started to questioning Marx's vision of emancipation based on the so kind of development of productive forces. So this is the moment when I paying atten started to paying attention to the relationship of, between humans, nature, and technology. So this was a very important moment for me. Because then I started actually looking at Marx's notebooks uh, because I was in Berlin and uh, there uh, there was an academy called uh, Berlin Brandenburgish Academy, that this new complete works of Marx and Engels is actually edited. It's still a project going on there. And then I was lucky enough to join the project. And then yeah. there, I actually happened to find that Marx uh, left a number of notebooks on natural sciences. Mm -hmm. uh, he didn't publish it because it was supposed to be preparation for writing his critique of political economy, that's capital. Yeah. Uh, but then I... Uh, while I was looking at them, I realized that he was actually really concerned about, for example, the issue of soil exhaustion, excessive deforestation, and that kind of issue of sustainability came up a lot in his notebooks, not necessarily in his published writings. Yeah. So this is really a new for me, and then I built on my thesis of ecological socialism based on what I discovered in his notebooks. Yeah, and we'll definitely get into uh, your ideas and your books. But just before we do, um, I just want to sort of ask you, so you, your books sold really well in Japan um, and they were like bestsellers. And obviously in, in the West here, when we think about Marxism, Japan's not necessarily a country that springs to mind as a hotbed of Marxism or communism. Um, was it a surprise for yourself that, that your book took off? Or is, he, is there actually something there in Japan that we just weren't, weren't aware of in Europe? Oh, yeah, yeah. Of course, it's a big surprise that my book actually sold uh, more than half a million copies because my book about communism <laughs> in the age of ecological crisis sounds quite crazy, right? Because everyone thinks, of course, in Japan, too, that the Marx is already outdated and proved mm -hmm. wrong after the collapse of Soviet Union and so yeah. on. However, uh, it's interesting to... Uh, actually say that uh, actually in Japan, Japanese society is very, very conservative, but at mm -hmm. the same time, Marx is quite widely read uh, before uh, right. the collapse of Soviet Union. So many uh, Department of Economics used to be occupied by Marxian economists. So even like today's politicians, like ruling class elite, establishment people, mm -hmm. especially now the age of 50s and 60s, have all some kind of experience with uh, Marxism. So in as a kind of the intellectual mind, they have some openness to Marxism. But that doesn't mm -hmm. mean that they are uh, passionate about transforming no. capitalism, right? So there's a, some kind of interesting uh, curious, historical but... <laughs> yeah, uniqueness yeah. <laughs> uh, where it kind of prepared uh, the reception of my book. But obviously, again, in, that doesn't mean uh, the guarantee of the success of my book. I think it was largely due to the fact that my book, um, Slow Down, which is now available in English too, uh, Slow Down came out in the middle of pandemic when the issue of yeah. ecological crisis as well as uh, economic inequality under capitalism, especially due to the neoliberal reforms, mm -hmm. became quite uh, acute. Uh, so I think people started looking really for alternatives in order to protect their own lives from mm. the pandemic and so on. Yeah, definitely. So now coming to some of the ideas in your book, um, I'm interested to know what made you decide that degrowth 
was the the theory for you because obviously when you're talking about planetary boundaries which you do in your book um, and maybe you can describe to the audience just how many we're we're exceeding uh, just to give a bit of background of, of the trouble we're in um you know i often think when people talk about planetary boundaries the look the, the one that springs to mind most obvious to me like donor economics um you know and and there is others as well um but degrowth you've obviously taken on degrowth what is it specifically about degrowth that you liked and that you decided to to bring into your analysis oh yeah so i explained that i discovered a marxian uh, vision of eco socialism uh, in germany so that was a part of my dissertation which is uh, published as karl marx eco socialism but at the time in my first book i never mentioned degrowth I simply said capitalism is unsustainable. It seriously distorts the relationship between humans and nature, creates a kind of metabolic rift, and that is irreparable under capitalism. So Marx said that we need to have a very different uh, vision of mode of production, which he, he thinks that will be more sustainable. So I called it eco-socialism. But... I must say that at the time I was uh, still too optimistic in a sense, and I was also kind of endorsing still a kind of productivism in the sense that even after the nuclear disaster in Fukushima, I still uh, believed that after the transcendence of uh, capitalism, if it's possible, eh? if it's something like that happens, socialism or can somehow uh, more rationally regulate the metabolic interaction between human and nature. And then in order to do this, they can also, the socialism can also develop new technologies, more sustainable technologies in a more efficient manner. So socialism can plan, it, only, it doesn't necessarily seek after only profit, but it can also care about environment and the equality. So I thought that under that kind of new conditions of production, it is possible to have more kind of economic growth under eco-socialism. My assumption was basically it is possible to decouple uh, the economic growth from resource and energy usage. For example, you know, if we uh, look at the history in the past, as the GDP grows, we also produced more carbon dioxide. But today, uh, if we invest in renewable energies or electric vehicles, they, you know, we often say that it is possible to decouple. We can still continue to grow our economy by selling more cars and installing new solar panels and wind turbines, but without necessarily increasing the emission of carbon dioxide. So this is really decoupling. Uh, compared to the past where we in, produced more cars, but it was always accompanied by more usage of fossil fuels and so on. So I was actually still at the time, five, six years ago, believing in that kind of possibility of decoupling economic growth from uh, environmental impact. So at the time, I also add that I was endorsing the Green New Deal, uh, which is uh, your topic. Yeah, I, so <laughs> I thought that, you know, in order to overcome the precariousness and the low wages uh, of Japanese workers, I thought it mm -hmm. is necessary to make this kind of green transition based on Green New Deal kind of policy so mm -hmm. that it creates uh, more jobs, more higher salaries, and then it can all kind of, you know, make a more sustainable just transition but i really changed my view uh, around 2017 or a well, little bit later 18 and 19 mm -hmm. when people like greta thunberg like a younger generation than i am uh started to do uh, more uh Inter like a climate justice movement right mm -hmm. and then for example in one speech greta thunberg said that the people, older people are still believing in the kind of the fairy tale of endless, infinite economic growth and that kind of thing, he, she said. And I, I actually came to realize that this uh, is 
the same, same structure between Tokyo and Fukushima, you know, the center of the capitalism, like Tokyo, are mm-hmm. actually becoming more and more affluent based on the exploitation of the countryside, like yeah. Fukushima. And the same structure can emerge on the global scale, like Japan or UK or the US can invest with or can grow with green technologies, but at the cost of the global south, right? So this mm-hmm. is a very simple story, but it's quite actually possible. So then I started rethinking about uh, this relationship about the decoupling and also the new technologies, how uh, are they feasible and so on, and then really gradually shifting towards degrowth. But then I had, a, again, this kind of a crisis, then how is it compatible with Marx's idea of eco-socialism? Degrowth is something that is beyond the imagination of Marxism. And then we have, often, like today, we have a lot of discussion about uh, how it is compatible or incompatible to the working class and those the idea of degrowth or green growth. And mm. that kind of debate was uh, very important for me four years ago and so on. And then the, one of the, my answer is elaborated in the book, Slow Down. Mm-hmm. Yeah, um, and I think you've highlighted an important point there in regards to what, what a, a particular title of, of a theory it can mean different things to different people. So just as you mentioned there about Green New Deal. So when most people think about the Green New Deal, I think you think about the US version, the sort of a massive investment into jobs and, and ele- electrifying everything and all that. And, and that is obviously a conversation. But in the UK, the, a Green New Deal is still quite an open space. So I think the reason, like, for example, we've chosen our, our name as the Green New Deal is because green is just a universal for the environment. Um, and then you've just got like New Deal, which is quite a generic, quite a broad term. So we just feel that it's a space that's still yet to be filled. Um, but again, well, again, it's the same. It's the same with degrowth. More as of a well. political vacuum, I think, in the UK. These. Well, yeah, 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 yeah. yeah. At the moment, there's nothing in it. <laughs> there used to be a little bit of something in it. Now there's nothing in it. Yeah, we've got to start just, again. Just over does it. too. Um, <laughs> um, but again, it's with degrowth, isn't it? There is people that that adhere to degrowth, call themselves degrowth scholars, there is maybe a foundation of what they agree with, but there's still conversations regarding, you know, different parts of it that are still open to discussion. Is that is that about right? Yeah, yeah. And then, so I actually, you know, for me, there are a lot of discussions on degrowth already, right? Mm-hmm. So why do uh, Marxists uh, actually say have to say something about degrowth? I mean, and actually some people believe that it's uh, not really important to uh, connect uh, Marx and degrowth because what Marx says really doesn't matter to degrowth. I mean, I understand that point, but at the same time, uh, it's true that for some people, uh, m- what Marx said matters. Live in the country near China, in China, for example, it really matters what Marx said. Uh, yeah. But also in other countries, you know, yeah. we have a lot of unionists, working class people, and then we need to make a concrete strategy and tactics mm-hmm. uh, yeah. for working class, right? And in order to imagine a new tactics and strategy, uh, it's really helpful to refer to what Marx actually said because his vision and his critique uh, of post-capitalism and his critique of capitalism is quite uh, uh, useful in order to build up a new movement and so on. Mm-hmm. And so my struggle was actually, so degrowth for me was very convincing, but at the same time, the existing working class movement are still endorsing uh, a kind of vision with more green growth. Mm. And so how would Marx analyze this tension? That was my question. Actually, it's too naive to believe that Marx simply said, okay, once we overcome capitalism, all those capitalist technologies will be somehow sustainable and emancipatory and so on. Right. So it's reasonable to assume that Marx had some other aspects, especially in his later years. So I started looking at other uh, materials that he didn't necessarily publish. The one was uh, notebooks on natural sciences. But at the same time, he 
studied quite intensively pre capitalist and non Western societies, especially he studied Russian agricultural communes quite intensively. So, my question was uh -huh. uh, why Marx was studying natural science and pre capitalist societies at the same time in order to finish volume two and three of Capital? So, all those things doesn't make sense, right? If he <laughs> was supposed to complete volume two and three of Capital, he should have studied uh, actually political economy or the de recent development of capitalism in Europe or in the US. Mm -hmm. But he didn't, he, he did this at, the, at to some point, but he spent more time and energy on studying new topics like natural sciences and pre capitalist society. Why? So I started reading his uh, notebooks on Russia. Uh, Iran and other societies. And I came to realize actually this seemingly unrelated topics of natural sciences and the pre-capitalist societies are actually connected. Different societies like pre-capitalist or non-Western societies have different way of interacting with nature mm. because they have different system of property different ways of uh, regulation, law, and different ways of relating to each other. So that also have significant impact on how we organize our relationship with the environment, right? So he then studied actually Germanic communes or Russian agricultural communes, and he came to realize that these societies actually consciously regulated in a way that the society doesn't grow. Even mm. if they have a potentiality of growing more, they didn't do it because often the growth could lead to economic inequality and the concentration of power. So those society actually consciously regulated their production for the sake of guaranteeing equality and freedom of people. But that also created a more sustainable condition of metabolic interaction. It's very interesting how Marx came to realize that those equal pre-capitalist societies is, are also more sustainable because those societies did not pursue economic growth as the first principle of social production. But capitalism is radically different. Right? Capitalism is about profit economic growth. And so that's really created a very different dynamics, which, however, had a significant impact in up on our metabolic interaction with nature and it's actually destroyed. So Marx actually came to advocate in the, to make the long story very short, actually he came to endorse that the steady state economy that was actually existent in pre-capitalist society. It's something that those Western capitalist countries need to learn in order to establish a more sustainable society after capitalism. So that's what Marx actually said in his uh, last letter to Russian revolutionary Vera Dasulich. He said, we have to, the Western societies have to go back to the higher stage of non-capitalist mode of production so that those society, Western societies can overcome the crisis of capitalism. So it's very di different from what we usually associate with Marx's vision of socialism. It's usually like a you know, very productivist, techno-fetish kind of view, yeah, but yeah. he had actually more uh, focusing on kind of the stability of society and the equality and the sustainability. Yeah, I suppose kind of like there is a, a, a vision of post-capitalism which kind of takes the productive force of capitalism and just makes it better for everyone as opposed to going, actually, this whole process needs to be broken down and kind of started again without the idea of having to increasingly do more things and be more productive at, at, at the heart of it. Um you mentioned earlier on uh, this term metabolic rift, and you know Marx is you know talks about metabolism quite a lot in in his kind of theory and practice. So could you kind of explain a bit more about this metabolic rift idea that you you write a lot about in uh, Marx and the Anthropocene as well? 
Yeah, yeah. So the metabolic uh, metabolism, the concept of Stoffwechsel in German, uh, is uh, basically the humans have to work upon nature, uh, mm -hmm. mediated by labor, in order to live. Right? Yeah. We we cannot live uh, uh, by nothing. So we have to work upon land, and we have to extract resources, and we have to produce uh, various products by working on uh, our environment. Mm -hmm. But the way how we actually concretely organizes uh, this metabolic interaction between human and nature is radically different in each society, especially in the mm -hmm. each mode of production. And capitalism has a very unique way of organizing this metabolism because capitalism has the primacy or the primary objective, which is capital's infinite growth and accumulation. Mm -hmm. And so the problem becomes the metabolism in society. So it's a, Marx actually distinguishes uh, two kinds of metabolism. It's a metabolism in nature, which exists independently of humans, uh, the soil, soil uh, or air, and air. many things happen in nature without uh, human intervention, right? That's a metabolism uh, in nature. But metabolism in society is actually consisting of the circulation of commodity, money, and capital. So social metabolism and capitalism accelerate uh, constantly because capitalism try to uh, shorten the circuit time. But at the same time, it con social metabolism continues to expand under capitalism. It really, today, subsumes the entire planet, which is why we call it the Anthropocene, right? But the problem is metabolism of nature or natural metabolism remained relatively constant uh, over the time of history. So while social metabolism constantly becomes faster and bigger, natural metabolism cannot catch up with this tempo of capitalism. Yeah. So what happens is actually the two kinds of metabolism, they actually connect to each other because the circulation and production of a commodity actually do not take place without those resources and energy mm -hmm. produced under the process of natural metabolism. But however, two logics of metabolism, natural and social, becomes quite uh, sort of dissociated with each other. Mm -hmm. And in the end, he Marx actually warns that under capitalism, there will be an inevitably irreparable rift between the natural and social metabolism. And it is irreparable because social uh, capitalism constantly or con must continue with the intervention of newer technology. It tried mm -hmm. to increase efficiency and it tried to solve or it tried to decouple. They are not sufficient because they are still used for the sake of producing more and producing faster. So it often ends up using more resources and energies. And that's yeah. why Marx says we really need to reorganize the entire metabolic process Mm -hmm. in a way that we don't necessarily focus simply on growth and profit. And this is why this idea of degrowth, which is basically, often people misunderstand, degrowth is not about going back to nature, going back to, you know, a life without technology. He, yeah. Marx says it's higher stage of pre-capitalist society. So he actually emphasizes that we have to use all that, whatever, technologies that are necessary to increase our efficiency and so on. But we have to use them, not for the sake of making more uh, surplus value or profit, but for the sake of more creating equal and sustainable relationship among yeah. humans, but also with nature. And this is a very fundamental idea for uh, degrowth communism. Because I suppose to to that point, actually, going back to that pre-capitalist place isn't about going back there without the technologies we have for you know medicines and various other kind of you know ways that society has improved over time. It's actually about going back to there in terms of the societal relationships we have. It's not about exactly. the stuff that we have. Yeah. So I mean, when I talk about degrowth communism, based on Marx's later writings. And, you know, he talks about, true, he talks about those Russian agricultural 
communes, but mm -hmm. he never says we should simply live like Russians, right? Yeah. <laughs> he rather says we have to combine both and we have to mutually learn from each other. It's not mm -hmm. simply, hey, Russians, look at our capitalism. It's much better, yeah. uh, even though we have problems, but we're going to overcome with socialism. So we, let's just follow this path together. Mm -hmm. No, he, he says he really abandoned that kind of Eurocentric idea in his later years. And then emphasizes rather to learn from uh, those non-Western societies. But that doesn't mean that simply going back today, we can, for example, say we have to learn from indigenous people and non-Western cultures. Mm -hmm. And we do these kind of things, right? But that doesn't mean that we abandon iPhones or the, you know, yeah, those yeah. technologies. And we also, I also do not say that we, uh, don't need uh, electronic vehicles. We should just live by bicycles. No, I don't say that. We need electronic vehicles and we need renewable energy because mm -hmm. otherwise decarbonization is obviously impossible. Yeah. But at the same time, what the growth actually calls for is simply using those electronic vehicles, not for the sake of producing profit. So that means that we should also limit or even reduce the number of the cars and the size of mm -hmm. the cars because in the global north there are too many cars and that those cars are often too big. So once we actually focus on the sustainability and the equality and justice, we can of course use those technologies because it's higher stage, mm -hmm. but we also can establish more different kind of relationship with technologies and with nature. And so that's my point yeah and um of all the the degrowthers that we've had on the show um kohei one that's really advocated or really promoted the idea of, of where the working class fit into this into this theory is uh, jason hickel who i know that you know um and his episode when we put it out was actually um titled degrowth means power for the working class so i'm just wondering in regards to your own analysis you know, where do you situate or where do you situate the working class? But also if you had a message for the working class, yeah, because at the moment it's kind of being degrowth, the stick that they beat degrowth with is, oh, it's going to affect, it's going to make working class poor, uh, it's going to make working. But if you had a message for the working class, what would you, what would you say in regards to where degrowth is situated in their day-to-day -day lives? Yes, I think all the people in the global north must learn from the global south and mm -hmm. we also have to reflect upon how our affluence in the global north is often based on the suffering and the poverty of the many people in the global south and the destruction of the environment in the global south. So what happened in the 20th century is actually the, you know, the revolution, socialist revolution didn't happen in many Western countries and Japan and other countries too. But that was because working class people had some kind of class compromise with capitalist class. But that, of course, kind of realized a better life and you know it really created some kind of possibility for achieving middle class uh, affluent life in the people in the global north but that was actually sh simply shifting the problem of exploitation somewhere else so that's what Marx Wiesen and Ulrich Plant the German uh, sociologist now calls imperial mode of living so our way of living in the global north is often associated with the suffering of other, some, some other people in somewhere else. But I think that's something what we really have to overcome in the face of this kind of planetary crisis, because the problem that we are facing today is uh, planetary. Even yeah. if yeah, yeah. the people or working class in the global north, in the UK or Japan, somehow uh, we implement Green New Deal, the American one, and then we became super rich, and but we have better life, 
but without uh, carbon emission. But if that was based on some kind of massive extraction of resources in the global south, and then if we monopolize all those resources, and then if the people in the global south con have to continue to use fossil fuels somehow, mm -hmm. then the planet will warm up in the end and we will be all dead, right? So I think this kind of way of achieving some kind of transition just for the sake of people or working class in the global north doesn't work anyway. Mm. I think it is very important to have a different vision of more sustainable and more just kind of transition. It's very important to learn from other people. I think we really need to have different vision of transition. And I think degrowth is essential presupposition to for us to talk about new strategies mm -hmm. in the 21st century. I, th I think without that, any attempt of radical transformation of capitalism will simply repeat the same failure of ecological imperialism, colonization, yeah. and even the greater suffering of more, more and more people as the earth degrades under the climate crisis. Yeah. Um, so some of the, the pushback of yourself, Kohei, that I've seen in regards to your, in regards to your work when it relates to Marx is, and I completely take your point, you know, we bring, we bring with us what we've learned, we bring with us what we know, and so it completely makes sense to me that you're a Marx scholar, and so you're going to bring what you know and what you love and what you're passionate about to, to any new idea. Now, one of the key ones that I've seen people sort of be horrified at, and I think it's, if it's because sometimes um, what Marx says, some of, this, some of his ideas can be looked upon as a kind of a sacred cow, um, is the idea around historical materialism. Um, so for a lot of Marxists, historical materialism is one of those golden eggs that he meant this and he never changed his mind. And this means that and nobody should ever, ever question or touch um, that concept. Now, just, just because some of our listeners may not know what that is, could you give us a brief overview of what historical material is? Um, and then maybe where you kind of took it on and maybe tweaked it or maybe this, maybe believe that Marx ne didn't necessarily see it as a sacred cow. Yes, the historical materialism is often considered as a law of history, the historical development. Mm. And uh, usually uh, we have different mode of production and the pr mode of production consist of two factors. One is relations of production and forces of production. And the mode of production is uh, slave mode of production, feudal mode of production, capitalist mode of production, and then maybe there's a socialist or communist mode of production. And then each mode of production has some kind of relation of production. Like in capitalism, we have wage and capital. And uh, in slavery, we have master and slaves. So that's the relation of production. And the forces of production is basically consistent with technologies and you know how much we can produce and that kind of uh, subjective capacity to produce something and the objective conditions of production, which is machinery, division of labor, and manufacture and so on, right? And then according to uh, historical materialism, when there's a tendency uh, in history uh, that forces of production increase and after a certain point there is a tension increasing tension between relations of production and forces of production for example in feudalism there's in, you know growing market and they, they try to produce more but the feudalist relations sort of impede uh, the further development so there's a will be a, some, after one point uh, the, the bourgeois revolution and uh, that really explodes uh, the relation to production and then establishes the new mode of production uh, that actually corresponds to the stage of forces of production. Uh, if we apply this argument to capitalism, if we continue to increase forces of production, 
or productive forces, there will be one day that we have enough capacity for everyone to be rich. But capitalism, the wealth is monopolized by a few capitalists. So right, like one day, there will be a massive kind of social revolution and so on. But this vision is quite simplistic and it's driven by the possibility of increasing productive forces. So often the socialists end up saying, okay, then first we have to focus on the more and more development of productive forces. And that's the kind of the ultimate reason of why so many socialists and Marxists end up naively endorsing any kind of technology, including nuclear power, right? But that's not valid anymore because we know like nuclear power, those technologies are actually not sustainable. Those technologies developed under capitalism are not necessarily emancipatory because those technologies are developed for the sake of controlling workers, dominating workers, but also exploiting more from nature. So it simply creates a more and more efficient way of exploiting both from human and nature. And Marx actually came to realize this after he studied natural sciences. So in the 60s, he had some kind of personal crisis. He used to believe that, okay, with the development of technologies, we can have some kind of socialism that everyone can have private jets or something like that. But in the end, he came to realize, shit, those technologies actually simply destroy the planet. So we can't really uh, simply naively say better, the, the, the more the technology, the better the future. He abandoned that in the 60s or even 70s. It took a long time for him to actually abandon historical earlier version of historical materialism. But with this constant process of overcoming his own theoretical difficulties, he tried to learn more about ecology, sustainable metabolic interaction with nature. But he also learned different ways of interacting with nature in different modes of production in Russia, in the United States, indigenous people, and so on. He came to endorse that, okay, not necessarily with this kind of dream technologies, we can have much more equal and sustainable kind of mode of production. And this is, I think, what Marx in the end would have called degrowth communism, because his last vision of communism is something radically different from what we usually associate with uh, historical materialism. And this is something also what we really need to learn, because I think Marxism can learn a lot from degrowth people and the recent discussion about uh, sustainability and so on. But also degrowth people can learn from Marxist tradition because capitalism is really the root cause of today's climate crisis. Yeah. And I think it's necessary to criticize capitalism. We need to have a very critical view of capitalism. And in order to overcome capitalism, simply building eco-village is not enough, right? That's mm -hmm. something what we actually know. We need to really reorganize various industrial sectors. And this is a tradition of uh, working class struggle, but also socialism has a lot of debates on how we calculate and plan our social production. And that kind of issues are something quite central in the tradition of socialism. And that's very useful for the growth. So I think we can mutually learn from each other and enrich our uh, theory. And that's the very important basis for building any revolutionary uh, practice for post-capitalism today. Yeah. Now, Marx wasn't just a theorist. He was a revolutionary. And obviously, he was always of the mind that his work... He wanted it to be put into practice. He wanted things to happen uh, to change, essentially, the world. Um, and you, you may have been expecting this question, Kohei, and I'm sure you get asked this a lot, but how, how do we put these things into practice when, you know, my opinions aside, for better or worse, 
Um, we live in a world that's dominated by neoliberal consumer capitalist powers. You know, um, the you know liberalism was all about. When all else fails, you know, a liberal will always fall back on the on the on the philosophical ideas of of individual rights, consumer rights, these sorts of things. And then, if you even if you can get past that, which I believe you can, um, they have the military. <laughs> the the system does not allow itself to be changed just through philosophy, logic, and reason. Um, and yet, you know, as, as your book states, we are currently exceeding. Six planet, six of nine planetary boundaries. Boundaries, so we are in deep shit here. So, Kohei, listen, you must be thinking about this day and night. You know, you must have ideas about a future book coming up. Are you a type of person that that is ready for the question of how to implement degrowth communism? Yes, yes. I think uh, you know philosophers are often staying in the ivory tower, and they are very. Uh, it's not even far phased. Away from it's not even phased. That's often the case, but I think uh, philosophers can be useful because often we still have a very capitalist way of thinking. Our common sense is basically dominated by uh, capitalist value standards, right? So I think when yeah. we associate, for example, the concept of abundance, we often think about having more money, having bigger real estate, and you know having a lot of things uh, like a commodity. So mm -hmm. for us, abundance is something associated with money. But actually, we have to redefine it because I think abundance can mean different kinds of things. For example, in my book, I argue for a radical abundance of communal luxury because for example we can share public transportation we can decommodify medical services uh, we can decommodify education we can also try to have some kind of free internet and so on and these are the things that do not necessarily produce the higher ecological impact but that can be accessible to everyone accessible to everyone is a fundamental condition of abundance, right? So abundance of information, abundance of public transportation, abundance of care. And these are the things what we actually need. It's not abundance of private jets. It's not abundance of SUVs. I think so one of the ways we have to first change the, those basic concepts. Otherwise, when we talk about we need a better life for working class, then we immediately think we need more higher salary for the sake of buying more things and buying bigger cars. They are not ecologically uh, sustainable anyway. So no, I right. think when we have to think about uh, something better for working class, we can, for example, think about shortening working hours mm. instead of think, simply talking about higher wages. But often even the unionists are trapped in those capitalist values mm. so they often only talk about higher wages more money better of course in capitalism but we can also talk about a society where we have more abundance of free time maybe that's more important right so i think these are the things that can be uh, implemented within capitalism free education free medical care free internet and these are already partially installed in the Western welfare state, mm. but we can also shorten working hours and we can also create more equal society by imposing higher taxes on certain luxurious items. We can even try to ban private jets and so on. And these are the things that we can totally implement within capitalism, mm -hmm. but they will have revolutionary impact, what we call like a non-reforminist reform can be achieved within capitalism mm -hmm. because they are non-reforminist because they directly challenge our relate our conceptions of abundance, our dependence on money and commodity and our way of behavior because we are so dependent on money. So we work too many hours and then we end up producing too many things and then 
we also waste energy and resources. Yeah. So that vicious kind of circle must be sort of abolished or at least reduced. And I think this is something that we can really uh, organize together with environmentalists. So this is a new alliance of red and green that can be both economically just as well as environmentally sustainable. Is that, as you write in Marx and the Anthropocene, uh, that abundance is not a technological threshold, but a social relationship to what your point is. So like, we're not waiting for some, we're not waiting for AI or the Star Trek replicator to come along to, you know, make abundance a thing. It's just a choice we have to make with it, with ourselves to do this. Exactly. Because when we think about abundance with AI or some kind of zero marginal costs, uh, Paul Mason talks about yeah. that kind of post-capitalist abundance. Yeah. It's actually not that radical mm. in a sense that we simply impose our capitalist value uh, without some kind of limitation to capitalists. Uh, like everyone, every worker becomes <laughs> some kind of a capitalist. But yeah. the problem is the earth is finite. That means we have planetary boundaries mm -hmm. and resources are also finite in a sense. We really need to have a more radical conception of affluence, radical conception of free time, happiness, well-being. There are a lot of things to do. Otherwise, we will simply repeat the kind of colonizing, imperialist way of living uh, in the future. So that's not green. That's not just. So I think, but however, the problem is many Marxists or left-wing people still trapped in that kind of myth of further development, especially those people in the global north, because mm. it's easier, you know, if technology solves all those problems, we don't have to really change our way of life. But I think it's no longer possible. I think it's also not good to continue this way because we work too many hours. Uh, we often sacrifice so many things that we should focus more on our well-being, free time, and justice, and equality. Like as as we're talking kind of about solutions and the path forward, I'm interested to know if like you're having conversations with like politicians and socialists, uh, actors in Japan about your work, and like what what is the reception from the people that you know look to do this through an uh, electoral process in Japan? Yeah, yeah. So I think it's very interesting that even the prime minister uh, Kishida uh, read my book and uh, during the wow. pandemic he <laughs> uh, really criticized the neoliberalism you know the yeah. LDP the liberal democratic party in power uh, sort of introduced neoliberal reforms in the last mm -hmm. 20 years but that only uh, enlarged inequality and so on mm -hmm. so he actually advocated for new capitalism <laughs> but you know of course. his vision was after all and you know about the more digitalization ai and the kind of uh, green growth and so on so he of course didn't go far enough to yeah. endorse some kind of socialism or whatsoever but it, it, there are uh, many discussions on the limitation of capitalism especially because mm -hmm. japan is uh, uh, suffering from the recession for like, long stagnation for 30 mm -hmm. years and many young people actually do not have any optimistic vision of the future uh, yeah. of Japan because the number of the population is also starting to decrease and so on. So in the sense that people are more open to different kind of vision, I think this is a very uh, great chance, opportunity for the leftist intervention. But the problem is the left is still trapped in the kind of the reviving uh, or stimulating economic growth uh, mm. in Japan so that all the workers can have higher wages and so on. Of course, That's higher wages here. better than That's lower wages. But, mm. yeah, yeah. but the problem is whether it's really possible, right? We mm. have tried so many things in the last 30 years and the growth does not happen, then maybe we should also plan for some worst cases uh, where the economy doesn't grow so we have to deal with something and then mm -hmm. I think degrowth is a first recognition of that difficulty of economic growth and then 
after recognizing this limit, we will think about how we can actually use this crisis as a new opportunity to have better, more equal society. And then mm -hmm. it's interesting in Japan that, yeah, not only politicians, but also people working in the big corporations actually listen to me. And today, yes, today I was on TV, mm -hmm. actually. And, you know, those kind of reception is yeah. starting to take place in Japan. And I think it will, of course, spread more in the coming years because mm -hmm. the crisis that we are witnessing will not go away in any way. So it mm -hmm. will only get worse as long as we continue today's uh, business as usual. So yeah. I think we really have to update our conception uh, so that we can really intervene in the mm -hmm. today's situation in a more critical manner. Totally, totally. Yeah. Okay, oh, hey, we won't keep you much longer, mate, but just just uh, with this one, you said something that I thought was really interesting. It was about how when you advocate for certain changes, those almost like those material conditions allow people to experience a new way of living and then almost a new way of thinking and they'll want another sort of, oh, we'll, we'll go down this path. And I, and I really think that's really... I often watch debates between sort of socialists and communists and, and people who are classed as progressives or liberals. And I think a big thing that, that the reason why they talk past each other is because, you know, a socialist, or a communist will, does believe that material conditions is what creates the way that we think, the way that we live the, and our cultures and our, and our social ways of, of interacting. Whereas a liberal will almost be, flip it around and say, no, it's, it's the consciousness, it's, it's the person who creates the material conditions. And often I, I think they're sort of talking past each other. So I really advocate that sort of way of, of thinking where, you know, you, you advocate something that is social. And once people absorb that policy or absorb that way of living, it will then, just through the material conditions, allow them to, to view another way of, of doing something and then maybe go down that path. So I thought that was really interesting. Um, just in regards to the next steps that we were talking about. So obviously, community is very important when it comes to action, right? So there'll be people listening to this now, Kohei, and they'll be saying, yes, I want to do more. I believe I'm an eco-socialist. I want to do this. What would you say that, that people should do like tomorrow? You know, is there a group that you advocate for on a universal level? Should people like, where do people put this energy before it dissipates and becomes a forgotten podcast? Like, you know, what, what do you advocate people to, to physically do like tomorrow, Kohei? Where should they go? Who should they speak to? What should they read? Who should they contact? How can they begin the journey to a new way of, of, of living? Yeah. In Japan, the problem is we, there are not many uh, social movements, environmental movements. And so it's even like really hard for many people to imagine that they can actually make some kind of a difference in society. So I often use this number, 3.5%. Uh, it's a famous number from Erika Chenoweth. And, you know, some leftists uh, are critical of this uh, uh, theory, but uh, basically she says that when 3.5% uh, of people uh, seriously stand up for some kind of change, change uh, yeah, change society uh, in a non-violent manner and so on. Mm -hmm. And this message is uh, to... No, you know, not this message is not, this theory is not necessarily applicable to the climate crisis because the climate crisis really uh, have the transformation of entire social infrastructure and the economic system. It's not like one dictatorship is go away and then uh, everything changes and so on. So it's, it's maybe not appropriate to use this number in terms of climate crisis, but at, at the same time, I want to emphasize that often under capitalism, when people hear about a climate crisis and they feel like doing something good, they often end up uh, doing some kind of eco-conscious uh, consumption, like uh, buying electric vehicles. And then they believe that, oh, I did something good for the environment and they stop doing things. I think it's very important to talk to other people and engage with them 
because consumption is an individual choice. It doesn't change the society. But if you recognize the problem, I think it's very important to communicate with your friends or colleagues or even like families to start some kind of discussion and they, you know, together uh, try to find a solution. And this is a beginning of creating this 3.5%. And I think it's hard. It's very hard indeed to change the social infrastructure. It takes many, many years, like 30, 40 years. That's why we have to act now. But my experience in the last five years or so, the ideas, our ideas actually change quite rapidly. For example, today, degrowth is spreading uh, Europe. I didn't myself accept the idea of degrowth five years ago, but now I'm pretty convinced. The same can be true or in terms of gender equality, and it can be said to other kinds of Black Lives Matter and so on. Our conception, our value standard mm-hmm. can rapidly change over one night even eh, after a certain experience. So maybe this conversation with someone else after you recognize this problem of climate crisis and you talk to someone else and for them, that will be the moment of change. So I think the value can actually quite quickly change. This is not the idealist way. No? It's a very material mm-hmm. because our mm-hmm. planet is in crisis. There's a material condition that compels us to change our consciousness. And then, so I think we can quite, there's a potential that in the next 10 years or so, degrowth becomes some kind of a new normativity. It's not yet today. It's not politically attractive for many mm-hmm. people, but in the last five years, it's been changing a lot. And I think it will accelerate in the next 10 years. And then I think it's really possible in the 30, 40 years, we will start making a kind of a transition to a more sustainable society. So I think it's still very important to read uh, philosophers like Karl Marx, because I think he really challenges us to change uh, what we take for granted under capitalism. And so this is a very uh, important to have this kind of discussion on Marxism, degrowth, and communism, especially if we are in the middle of a crisis. Some people say, mm. no, we should focus on more concrete policies and so on. But I think we need to have big, uh, bold ideas precisely because we are in a very uh, serious crisis. That we are. Ko, Ko hey, you've been a fantastic guest, mate. Thank you so much for your time. Um, and we wish you. you well for the future. And I'm looking forward to any work that you are thinking about. I'm sure you are at the moment and um, potentially get you on in the future to discuss that. But thank you so much for today. Okay, guys, this is part of the show that you're all familiar with where we give a bit of a shine, a bit of a shout out for people uh, that are doing their bit for all of us on this planet of ours. Uh, Cole, hey, who have you got this week, mate? Yeah, I want to thank my children, Listo and Lisa. (laughs) Yeah, they are still young. They are seven and four year old. Uh, You know, they don't really know about climate crisis, but, Mm -hmm. you know, they really compel me to think about better future and act for it because Mm -hmm. uh, it's really important for my generation to stop the climate crisis because it is only our generation that makes this decision. If we don't do Mm -hmm. anything, our ecological impact will last thousands and ten thousands of years. So I think really after having a family, I really think more seriously about uh, the future and they give me hope they are uh you know looking forward to new society and i i want to uh grow up with them of course that's lovely that's that, mate. thank you for that mm. and a big thank you to everyone that is listening and remember if you're helping the planet in any way at all no matter how big or how small we love you we appreciate you and we hope you join us again next time take care everyone bye We'd like to say a massive thank you to all of our supporters on Patreon. And a special shout out to our top tier patrons, Barbara Burke, Pierre Munt, Jill Burke, Joelyn Stone, Karen Taylor, Lizzie, Marie-Louise O'Hanrahan and Steve Smith. 
Thank you so much for your support. If you'd like to join these amazing people and support the show, head to patreon.com forward slash GND Media UK. And if you can't afford to help us out, please leave us a review on iTunes, Spotify, or wherever you get your podcasts. Thank you so much. 